Good evening and very warm welcome to this first series uh, that we have begun here with the RIS and India International Center in partnership for analyzing and taking forward our narrative on banks and the financial sector. What exactly is happening? Every day we see in newspapers and media, a lot of coverage of the new initiatives that are there in the banking sector, in the finance, and we also see several indicators which are unfolding every moment uh, when we pick up any business newspaper or any daily newspaper. There are several new initiatives that are bringing in more inquisitiveness, more anxiety, and more optimism, and in some minds, more pessimism in terms of how we are going forward or whether we are really going forward. So these kind of issues are creating a lot of public debate. And as you know, India International Center has been providing the forum for discussing several of these issues. As a think tank at RIS, we have been analyzing these issues uh, much more closely and have been trying to bring forward uh, what perspectives are there for uh, India as a, as a nation, but also uh, among the developing countries and among the societies that are uh, extremely keenly following the global developments, what is it that is there in store for India? And with that request, we approached uh, 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 President Mr. Vora at India International Center, and we agreed for a joint initiative uh, for next six seminars that would be organized over a couple of months to explore and discuss uh, some of these issues. The first and foremost uh, issue that came up in our uh, collective thinking process was about savings. And friends, as you know, uh, the debate in economic literature is, is uh, standing for long in terms of uh, uh, what are the long run effects of domestic savings on income and between savings and growth, uh, whether in India or in developing countries in general. And the predictions in uh, neoclassical uh, exogenous uh, growth models and post neoclassical endogenous growth models, uh, the issue has been in terms of significant uh, long run effects of savings on income. And if you look at the stylized uh, evidence for the uh, study state effects of savings on income, they suggest uh, a need to accelerate domestic savings to finance capital accumulation and foster higher income and growth. And from that point of view, most of the savings, uh, uh, they come from uh, the surplus household uh, uh, sector and the deficit uh, in the private corporate and, and public sector which draw on household savings. But if household savings are uh, continuously declining, then what offer developing countries or countries in transition would have to generate those resources? So it is not about the savings rate per se. It is about the growth model we are choosing, the way we see the larger balances that are coming in, and somehow the uh, neoliberal growth models have rejected the role that savings would provide in the days to come. And as a result, savings have gone off the radar of many countries. In 60s and 70s, you might recall having uh, invested in uh, IDBI and ICICI as institutions, uh, which were very much there and after their privatization, we lost out on those vehicles. We did a study two years back at RIS uh, just to examine top 200 firms in India, where do they raise their resources from? And to our utter surprise, we found that they land up in external market, in external sector for resource generation. So we need to see how long-term vehicles are there for investing. This time when finance minister was consulting economists, quite a few of us suggested uh, uh, to create vehicles for uh, taking forward uh, long-run deposits that uh, Indian uh, citizens would like to have. We always say that uh, uh, we are a nation of young but we forget that we have a huge population which has interest in pension and pension savings. So we require parking of that for 20 years, for 30 years to finance and support our infrastructure. So friends and colleagues, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, extremely rich panel and I'm sure for next six seminars that we have thought of, it would be extremely exciting in terms of how the banking and finance sector is leveraging technology is leveraging new ways for the new India that we are looking at. 
and also would generate uh, ideas and discussions, please do put in your questions in the chat box. And we have a very eminent uh, uh, chairman for the session here today uh, uh, in form of uh, Mr. Rajneesh Kumar, uh, who is former chairman of the State Bank of India. Uh, but before I invite him to chair the session, I would first request uh, uh, Shri Anand Vora, president of the India International Center, uh, for his inaugural remarks for the uh, six series that I just now mentioned. Uh, Vora Saab, you have the floor now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chaturvedi. <clears throat> As uh, Dr. Chaturvedi just mentioned, in a recent discussion with him, incidentally, besides being a DG RIS, he's a member of the Board of Trustees of the IRC and also the Chairman of our Finance Committee. And I have uh, very frequent occasions to raise issues with him and to get his advice on uh, matters of household management. We are running into very serious problems uh, to meet our ways and means position. Now, amongst the things I, I raised with uh, Dr. Chaturvedi, one was uh, per chance on that particular day, uh, I had read a piece of economic writing. Uh, we talked about investment, savings, generations, and so on. And I asked him, we were waiting for the meeting to start, what, what if any, were the specific reasons why in our economic uh, policy planning uh, we had either denigrated or been indifferent to uh, the concept of small savings, concept of savings as such, household savings, and the relationship of savings to investments and growth. In this context, I would like to go back to the past. When I joined the civil service in the late 1950s, those early days after attainment of freedom, independence, uh, the country had no resources. The British had left behind a very impoverished economy, highly imbalanced, enormous poverty, no industrialization potential, and so on. And the government of the day had to declare a financial emergency. And when uh, our constitution was endorsed and adopted 1950, the planning commission came into being, the planning policies were put in position. I would like to very briefly recall to the eminent experts we have on the panel today and Shri Rajesh Kumar, the eminent former chairman of this former Imperial Bank of India, the later the State Bank of India, that we had uh, devoted very high importance to savings. Every state had a state small savings board. Every state had a director general small savings. Why I particularly refer to small is that they were truly small, uh, essentially small. And we had various instrumentalities, um, postal, banking, not banking very much because Banking networks had still to develop. I'm talking of early 1960s. And um, most of the instruments were postal. 5 rupee bond, 10 rupee bonds, 20 rupee bonds, 50 rupees, 100 rupees. There were very few 500 and 1,000 rupees because nobody had that kind of money. It may seem laughable today, but what I'm telling you was reality. So every district had a target. We had to fulfill that every month, not every year, every month. We couldn't be lagging behind. Those districts in the state we did well were awarded prizes. And um, individual, uh, individual functionaries and outside the government volunteers who did good small savings work were awarded um, some honors, awards, medal, medals, and so on. So I really don't know what were the factors Consequently, when our economy got on the growth path and uh, we started doing well, then I suppose the foreign flows were coming in. So external uh, sources were more dependable or more easily available. And one didn't have to waste time and energy in collecting five rupee notes and hundred rupee notes. I don't know whether the economists would know that better. But I would still say from common sense point of view and the point of view and perspective 
of inclusivity, of the involvement of every family in the country in the growth process, in the development process, that I chip in 5,000 bucks for a one year or two years as savings investment, and that becomes a component of the overall resource to the country, then the, the, there is some money available, 5 million, 50 million, 500 million, and so on for investments and further regeneration, further growth. So it is in this background that I have requested Dr. Chaturvedi, and he very kindly accepted my request. And today's seminar uh, webinar is the first in the series. And as he mentioned himself, it is a matter of great satisfaction that RIS and IIC have agreed to join hands and have a series of webinars. Dr. Chaturvedi suggested six in the beginning, fine. Uh, these will be on areas and issues uh, in the realm of finance, in the realm of banking, in the realm of overall economic issues. So I would not stand very much in the way because I got an indication that my time is over. So uh, back to you, uh, Sachin, and once again, my grateful thanks and to, to Professor Rajeshwar and all our other panelists who have kindly spared time to be with us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir, for your kind words and for guiding us and giving us the sense of history and emphasizing on the point of inclusivity in our savings and uh, possible contribution that each citizen can make in terms of uh, making India proud in terms of how we mobilize resources and bring in actual the idea of self-reliance that you mentioned. And incidentally, uh, that uh, also reminds me of the huge resources that India could mobilize in uh, uh, 70s and 80s because of the mutual funds that people contributed in and provided the heft and the gravitas to our uh, uh, investing. And in fact, sir, throughout uh, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, all the growth models that, uh, that came up, be that from uh, uh, Harrod or from Doma, from Solo, uh, uh, or, or even from Tarlok Singh uh, in, uh, in India itself, we find... Uh, uh, them emphasizing on this uh, growth and saving uh, nexus. Somehow uh, it has gone off our radar, as I said in the beginning. But sir, thanks a lot. I keenly look forward for this. I must also mention here that uh, uh, the Governor Reserve Bank of India is very keenly engaged in this process and uh, I'm thankful to him for his guidance and uh, uh, to Deputy Governor, Mr. M.K. Jain, uh, uh, who suggested us to approach uh, Mr. Rajneesh Kumar. And, uh, and I'm very grateful to Mr. Kumar for agreeing to join us and uh, chair the first uh, uh, seminar in this series. Uh, 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 Mr. Rajneesh Kumar is a, is a banker and incidentally joined in 1980 when, uh, uh, as Vodasab mentioned, uh, we have gone through these uh, uh, phases ourselves and, and uh, being a banker, uh, Mr. Rajesh Kumar must have explored uh, uh, the way the policy has evolved uh, and has seen the process of liberalization. Uh, uh, he also headed uh, SBI Capital Market Limited as its managing director before becoming uh, uh, chairman and managing director of India's uh, largest bank, uh, uh, the State Bank of India. Uh, so, Mr. Rajesh Kumar, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you sir, very much, uh, Professor Sachin. And uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Professor Sachin and Mr. Vora for inviting me to chair this panel. And I also appreciate that this is a very welcome initiative that the issues of importance which are plaguing the Indian economy. And you have decided that there will be a series of discussions and this is first such discussion. And the topic also which you have picked up, it is one of the most relevant topic and it has been in the news recently because the decline in the savings rate in India, uh, it has become a matter of concern. So before going to the new policy options, and I'm sure that the panelists uh, who are uh, here today, they will have a lot of ideas. But let me give you a little bit of an overview and the banker's perspective that what has happened, uh, Mr. Vora, was mentioning about the small savings. And when I joined the bank in 1980, uh, those were very different uh, period. And since then, the financial markets in India 
they have seen a lot of developments and i will uh, briefly touch upon that and some of the ideas which have come to my mind that also i would like to share and uh, so just to give you an overview uh, if uh, for the last uh, couple of uh, years and starting say maybe from 2000 the high investment and an economic boom during the period 2003 to 2008 was supported in india by a very high savings rate and it surged from 25.9% in financial year 2003 to 36.8% in financial year 2008 but because there has been a slow down in the economy so it has taken its toll on the savings and to uh, the savings rate measured as a ratio of gross domestic saving to gross national disposable income it has touched a 15 year low in financial year 19 and household savings are also falling so obviously this is weaken the india's micro macroeconomic position and uh, uh, we are seeing lower investment in the economy and rising external borrowing to fund capital and uh, definitely what we need is a higher savings rate in the economy domestic savings and reduce the dependence on the external commercial bond uh, the savings rate fell to 29.7% in fy19 and uh, the peak was 34.36.8% point, uh, in fy8 and 34.6% in fy12 and previous low was 29% in 2004 so this is what has happened in the last 20 years now in the pandemic uh, one interesting trend which has emerged that the currency and the deposits with the bank both have increased normally they move in the uh, contrary direction when the currency increases the deposits go down and vice versa but this time the trend has been that both have grown and the liabilities of the households net fin the financial liabilities of the households have come down so this is a phenomena which has been witnessed in the uh, pandemic and another uh, figure which would be of interest to all of us who are participating here is that the household savings in bank deposits which mr gurav was uh, elaborating Uh, it is around 4.1 percent of the GDP uh, for the year ended March 2019, and it declined to 3.6 percent in March 2020. So banks have reduced their uh, interest rates following a sharp cut in the repo rate. So these are the just uh, a few numbers for setting the context. Now. what needs to be done or what is happening so first of all uh, the one thing uh, which i would like to uh, uh, bring to the attention of all the participants is that as far as the development of financial markets is concerned in the last 30 years uh, there has been a phenomenal development uh, mr chaturvedi spoke about the mutual fund so today the capital markets in india are very well developed and uh, we can match in every respect uh, any other developed economy in the world same i can say that the adoption of the technology by the banks and the financial inclusion initiative of the honorable prime minister which is started with his speech of august 2014 since then almost 40 crore janthan accounts have been open so this is a very welcome initiative where the so far unbanked these people have been brought to the banking system formal banking system and this has been possible only because of the technology and what is called the jam trinity so janthan accounts aadhar which is a unique identity and the mobile which is i mean uh, uh, in india today we have uh, more than 60 crore smartphones and mobile uh, penetration is very high 
so the digitization and the adoption of the technology by the financial system it has been a great enabler uh, in payment system india is again counted amongst the one of the most developed economies npci is unique it has become a uh, model where uh, many developed economies in fact are discussing and talking about the payment system which india has developed the recent and the most latest is rbi's initiative where uh, now 24 by 7 we can move money uh, through neft and rtgs so we have a system where because of the developments uh, the uh, financial system as an intermediary it has never as well placed as it is today uh, but there are several issues uh, one of the issues is unlocking of the capital and faster resolution of stress reset is required second is we have been developing for a long time about deepening the corporate bond market but here always the issue around preempting of resources by the government that comes in so that is one issue where we need to pay more attention and there is a need crying need for long term uh, resources for funding the infrastructure the national infrastructure pipeline is almost uh, uh, 1.06 trillion rupees so for investing that kind of money definitely we need long term funding and uh, here the incentivization for the bonds and the maybe the retail participation in the bonds in a big way with all the safeguards because of the all the market risk uh, which is there so that is uh, one where i think the government can take uh, policy initiatives to make it more attractive for the retail investors new instruments like invits and reits they have started taking roots in the country it is a big name the size is insignificant but that is another instrument or the new instruments where uh, investor can get uh, good returns the other development which may have impact in my view is the new wage bill where the uh, component of the pay on which the provident fund or the retirement benefits would be determined so it is proposed that uh, it has to be higher and the parts cannot exceed 50% second is uh, uh, in my view the retirement uh, savings uh, we need to incentivize the retirement savings in a bigger way in our country the disposable incomes are low social security uh, is weak so in such a scenario unless there is a proper incentivization uh the uh, the incentive to save for a long term is not uh, there or there is not enough incentive and uh, uh another point which i would like to make here is that we need to strengthen our msme and flow of bank credit to the msmes and in the entire scheme of things we cannot ignore such an important segment so we need to make them stronger and uh, we need to ensure that there is a more flow of credit to the uh, msme sector so these are some of the initial thoughts and as we hear the other panelists and uh, i'm sure that uh, uh, once we conclude this session at least we will have some good thoughts and uh, recommendations uh, which even can go to the policy makers so thank you once again for inviting me thank you uh, thanks thanks mr rajesh kumar for uh, a real 360 uh, degree view of the key issues that are involved you have covered a vast range of uh, uh, and i think you have made the task difficult for our panelists because they would have really very limited time uh, to come up uh, uh, with uh, but I, i would suggest that uh, each one can uh, uh, pick up some dimension of the several list of issues that uh, uh, chairman of this session uh, uh, mr rajesh kumar has placed uh, i i really uh, enjoyed two of his observations one that he uh, showed statistics in terms of how uh, savings rate are consistently declining the point that uh, boras have made in the beginning 
and also that we need uh, mechanisms for incentivizing uh, uh, long-term savings, particularly the pension funds. And, uh, and as I said, uh, we very often uh, forget when we observe that it's a nation of youngsters that uh, we have a growing number of pensioners as well with the long-term saving interest. So now, friends, we are set for uh, uh, our uh, exciting panel discussion. Uh, we have uh, uh, three very eminent uh, uh, economists, uh, and, and I'm very glad, and I was very keen to uh, pick up some of the uh, younger brains as well, and and, uh, and I would be introducing them. Uh, uh, first, let me invite uh, Professor Anant Narayan, uh, uh, who has been uh, very much evident in all our newspapers on his uh, uh, through his commentaries. Uh, uh, he is uh, a practitioner. He has worked with uh, Standard Chartered Bank. He has worked with uh, Dosh Bank and Citibank. Uh, he now teaches finance at SPGN Institute of Management and Research in Mumbai and, uh, and has been uh, 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 very frequently commenting in newspapers uh, 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 since I'm a member of the IWG and we gave this report. I was very impressed to see his uh, write-up when he uh, talked about the uh, future for uh, 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 banking in India and the role that uh, uh, different actors can play. So, uh, without further ado, let me now invite uh, uh, Professor Arun Narayan for his speech. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi. Um, absolute pleasure and privilege to be here. Thank you, Vora Saab and the um, India International Center for, for this privilege. Uh, thank you, Rajneesh Kumarji. It's uh, always a pleasure and a privilege to share the dais with you, a virtual dais, but nevertheless a dais with you. Uh, and uh, Chat Chaturaji Saab, but next time, please don't put me after Rajneesh Kumarji. Very, very difficult act to follow. So uh, space me somewhere else, please. But uh, truly an honor. And um, one of the reasons why, and uh, also to my fellow panelists, um, Professor Sapre and Professor Agrawal, uh, pleasure to see you and, and meet you. Uh, one of the problems I have, Professor Chaturvedi, is uh, I am not a trained economist. And that topic is a heavy economist topic. You know, savings rate is, is a macroeconomic uh, person's delight. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm going to pretend I'm an economist and speak like an economist. My subsequent panelists can um, come and correct whatever I've said and, 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 and change everything. Um, I, I will try and mix both practice as well as uh, the theory. And I want to make the following point, sir. One is um, we will look at the data as Rajesh Kumar ji did of, let's say, India's savings rate and, and China's savings, savings rate. But I do have a, pop, a problem with the formulation. The formulation seems to suggest that if only we were to increase our savings rate, a lot of our macroeconomic ills, whether it is growth, whether it is investment, whether it is lower inflation, whether it is external balance, whether it is financial stability, all of that will follow. And uh, at least as a practitioner and as a learner, uh, I have a problem with that formulation. I, I, will, I will express it in a in, in a in a small way, uh, and then from there I will go on to a takeaway as to what really is required for us to uh, get our savings rate up, and and therefore what is the secret of of macroeconomic stability. So let me let me start right away as Mr. Rajesh Kumar rightly pointed out. Uh, by the way, our savings rate in India was about only 16% in 1975. It went up to something like 26% in 2000. Uh, as Mr. Rajneesh Kumar said, the, the golden year, so to speak, uh, was between the period 2005 to 2013, where it was about 35%. Uh, before the pandemic hit us, it had dropped to about 30% in FI19, which is obviously a cause of worry. Um, if you contrast that with China, China has seen a consistently higher savings rate. So for instance, it was about 35% in 1975, uh, went up to higher than 50% in 2010. Uh, it's now even now it's a, it's about 45 percent before the pandemic hit. Obviously, savings has gone up in every country after the pandemic, but we'll come to that subsequently. But as I mentioned, I have a problem with this formulation, and the formulation is the following: We should not think of savings the way a household think of say, things of savings. When you're talking about the economy savings, it's a very different animal. Okay, we have a different problem, which Mr. Bora mentioned and Mr. Rajesh Kumar mentioned. What do our savers earn? That's a totally different problem. It's not the macroeconomic problem that uh, otherwise underlines the theory. See, when we are as households trying to improve our lot, we are often encouraged to bring down consumption, increase savings, and invest in assets like houses, right? That's the path to prosperity over time. Uh, that kind of formulation works when your income is fixed 
And therefore, if you reduce your consumption, your savings goes up and you can use that savings, hopefully, in productive investments for a household. Normally, that's a house. Okay, um, That logic does not work for the economy as a whole. Okay, Now, think of it this way. If I uh, nowadays, I don't go for a haircut as much because I've lost all my hair. But when I go for a haircut, I pay money to the barber to buy a haircut. Right. What am I doing? I have stored value of savings with me, which I've earned from my earlier services and goods produced in the form of money. That money as a store of value, I transfer to the barber. The barber registers an increase in savings because he's now got a store of value for the services provided and consumption in the economy has gone up because I have consumed a haircut. Okay, So consumption does not mean savings of the economy as a whole comes down. It just means that the consumer has given part of her savings into the producer. Okay, It gets a little complicated with the taxes, but ignore that for the time being. The point being, for the economy as a whole, consumption does not does not change savings. Okay, Now, on the flip side, if all of us stopped having haircuts, saying that, you know what, uh, let's all start to save. And, and that's the thinking that normally comes when we have discussions like this. If we all say, let's start to save and stop having haircuts or get our get ourselves, uh, give ourselves a haircut or get our family members to give a haircut. What happens? The net savings in the economy does not change. Money does not change hands. Nothing happens. I don't create fresh savings for the economy as a whole. All I've done is I've brought down consumption in the economy. And therefore, the GDP growth in the economy has come down. OK, so here is the takeaway. We should not think of increasing savings in the economy as a whole as being something that requires a reduction in consumption. That is absolutely a dangerous path to go in. Now, here is a twist. It does work when the consumption is imported consumption, which is what happened after the pandemic. If I stop buying the Apple Watch from Taiwan or from the US, OK, I increase my savings or the, or the country because if I had made that consumption, I would have transferred my savings to the foreigner, to the person who produces, who happens to be sitting outside. So technically, we can as a country increase our savings if we reduced our imports okay, or if we increased our net exports. But reducing imports without touching domestic consumption, very, very difficult task. It's a, it's a slippery slope. It's not easy to say I will only reduce imports. I will not reduce overall consumption. So my broad point, therefore, is we should not think of savings the way we would think of in the case of a household. Economic savings is very, very different. So comes back to the question, what creates savings in the economy? And here is my formulation, which is my formulation. It's a, it's a controversial formulation, but I think it works. First, investments create savings. What happens when? I buy a house when, when I let's say I have money with me. It is savings already. I convert my money savings into a house savings. I build a house and I pay the money to the builders of that house. I have created, I have transformed my savings from cash into a house and I have paid money to the people for this particular investment creation that has created additional savings. I have a house. That person has got money. There is additional savings in the economy. Here is another cor corollary. Bank lending creates savings. Bank lending for creation of, of factories of productive capacity creates individual savings by the same logic. Likewise, again, a controversial statement. Government spending creates savings. Now, it doesn't mean that, that savings will not lead to inflation. That's a totally different problem altogether. But when the government spends money and it runs a fiscal deficit and it borrows from banks, you are creating savings in the economy. And the third route for creating net savings is when you have net exports. If your exports are higher than your imports, your savings in the domestic economy go up. These are the three routes for increasing savings in the economy as a whole. Investment, net government spending, and your uh, net exports. Okay. So what therefore, so I have a problem therefore of treating savings as the independent variable. It's not. It's the result of several other things happening in the economy when you see the macroeconomics as a whole. So what then is the policy formulation going forward to increase savings and to get overall macroeconomic uh, health in the country? I think there is a simple answer, which is extremely difficult to manage. We've not managed it for the last 100 years. That answer is creating jobs and output in this country. 
Okay, why is it that 44% of our workforce is still engaged in agriculture? Why is it that only 17% of the GDP as measured by CSO is contributed by women in this country? It's a shameful statistic. It, you know, Middle Eastern countries manage those kind of numbers. Ours is a shameful statistic. Why is it that it's not just, by the way, energy and gold that we import? You think of chemicals, you think of fertilizers, you think of plastics, you think of toys, you think of electronics, everything, bulk of things are imported. I sit on the board of a company which manufactures reagents and equipment for medical testing. 70% of their raw materials was imported from China. Uh, after all, what happened in the last one year, they, they were very proudly told us in the board meeting that, you know what, China's imports are zero. I said, fantastic. So are we now producing everything locally with, with SMEs? No, we're importing everything from Japan. I said, can we think of creating an ecosystem where SMEs can create these formulations in India? That CEO looked at me as, as if I've gone mad. He said, it won't happen. It will take a long, long time to happen. We have made it extremely difficult in this country to create jobs and output in this country. Okay, and it's shameful that an underemployed population has to import so much of stuff and we are not able to produce goods to, you know, to satisfy our own demand. Here is the macroeconomic theory which will work. We create money by way of bank credit and by way of, of, of investments. That in turn creates capacity to produce, that creates output, that creates jobs, that jobs creates demand and savings and more investment and the virtuous cycle continues. That's what created the miracle of China. It was investments which created jobs and output, which made every other macroeconomic theory look good, including allowing them to lie about their numbers. Okay, Why is it that the, the, the Chinese savings rate is as high as it is? Because they create money. They've done so much of investments. Their, ba their bank credit to GDP ratio is over 200%. Ours is 50%. That obviously creates savings. They are net exporters. They are manufacturing capital of the world that obviously creates savings in our case you know 2008 was our maximum savings why was that because guess what during that time rajesh kumar sir will remember credit offtake used to be about 30 percent right we also had a situation where in 2008 after the financial crisis the fiscal deficit was blown up and by the way imports came down because oil prices came down so obviously our savings number went up so the, the formulation is a bit different eventually it comes down to jobs and output that requires a few things to happen. One, a cleansing of the financial sector. Today, you know, we're talking about survival of the financial sector. Of course, it will survive, but we, it's not enough if it survives. It has to run a marathon. It has to create credit. It has to grow our credit to GDP ratio in the form of fostering investment so that output and jobs can be created. At the moment, is it is in no shape to fund India's aspirations. Lots of things need to happen out there. The second part to that is ease of investments. You know, good things have happened. Labor law reforms, tax cuts have happened. Uh, this PLI, the production linked incentives, these are all good steps. But you won't create jobs and output by changing three laws. It is a continuous process which requires multiple things to happen. China did not become China in three years. It became in 30 years. Lots of other work has to happen, particularly around land laws, particularly of around our courts, around our policy stability. We have to make it easier for people to create jobs and output in this country. Again, very quickly, things like our power sector, real estate sector, telecom sector, airline, shipping, all these are running with chronic stresses. They have to be cleaned up for jobs and output to be created in this country. Okay? The last part for creating savings I mentioned is government in, um, uh, money. Now, this is a dangerous topic because the moment the government hears that I can create savings by spending, guess what? The printing presses will run, run forever. It's not that easy government spending can create inflation okay so what is the point about government spending it has to be going into the right areas for job creation what that what does that include obviously infrastructure the next part is it has to go into health it has to go into education it has to go into nutrition it has to go into sanitation not because of the goodness of our heart but unless we have healthy children who are capable of creating jobs and output when they grow up our future is doomed so it is an it is an imperative. It is not of a goodness of our heart. So the point is, government spending is required. Let them run fiscal deficit. I'm supposed to be a fiscal hawk. Let them run a fiscal deficit, but it has to be towards productive investments. It can't be towards revenue expenditures and revenue deficits. Today, our revenue deficit, if you remove the accounting smoke screens, is about seven percent of GDP. Bring Thank it down percent in 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 five to six years time, and sh push all that money into capital investments. So long story short. Um, savings is not the independent variable in my humble opinion. I'm not a trained economist, so please slap me later on. End of the day, the requirement is jobs and output. 
you get jobs and output in place, everything, including our savings, including inflation, including growth, including equality, everything will get sorted out. A lot of jobs required for that, cleaning up the of the financial sector so that it can fund investment, making ease of investments easy to create jobs and output. And finally, government spending into productive sectors, including into education, infrastructure, healthcare, sanitation, um, all of that has to happen for the match. It's not an easy job at all. As an armchair professor, I can give gyan and say, Ye karna padega. Actually, doing this on the ground extremely difficult. I'll stop there. I'm sorry. I think I would. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Ryan, for very, very insightful and very stimulating uh, uh, points and uh, excellent articulation. Thanks a lot. We now turn to our uh, young and bright mind, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Amea Sapre. Uh, he has been uh, uh, with uh, uh, NIPFP uh, uh, for some time. Before that, he was teaching economics at IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, he's uh, uh, pretty well known through his several papers that he has done at NIPFP. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ame, you have the floor now. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much, Ajahn, sir. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I hope you can hear me all. Uh, thank you very yes, much. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting and a good evening to all distinguished members in the panel. Uh, honestly, this job has become now very difficult because after uh, Rajni sir has already spoken, has highlighted a lot of issues and of course the broad introduction that uh, Sachin sir has already given coupled with the some of the issues that uh, Professor Anand has already mentioned. My understanding of the issue started as a researcher in the domain of national accounts and the issue of savings is far more complicated than it appears to be. I have a small uh, presentation sort of so to share. Uh, I may keep my close to you so that we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a small presentation to share in which I thought that I will highlight few issues which are normally not a part of discussion. And this is where uh, my intention is to bring out some complexities in, in the savings puzzle. Uh, as you know, the entire the broad talk that has been going on is concentrating largely on financial savings. Although Professor Anand really articulated very well when he said that financial savings translated into household in, in physical households, that is the link that we sort of understand between financial savings and physical savings. Now, uh, most people are aware, I don't want to present statistics to such an uh, I mean, illustrious set of panel, but I will concentrate on two main issues. One is what are we measuring in savings? That is the first point because although a lot of data is available, a lot of numbers are available and quite frankly, the talk sort of reduces to some numbers. But if you realize that the measurement issues in savings are so complex that it's hard for any person to understand what is the real trend that is happening in savings. I will highlight two, three things in my 10 minutes. First, what is the landscape that we are talking about, physical and financial savings of households particularly? What trends are we sort of finding that are emerging out of it? And is it any worth for us to infer anything out of this? As you know, uh, in the national accounts, the largest component of our savings, which is contributed by the households, is treated as a residual. Because what we measure are the savings of private corporations and the public sector. The residual is given as, as is treated as the share of households. Now, post 2015, that is when the new GDP series was introduced, that is 11, 12 base year series, a lot of classification changes happened, which have changed the composition of our savings simply by design. Nothing may have changed actually in the economy. Such simple classification changes make a huge difference in terms of numbers. One simple example, in, in the previous 2004-05 series, the expenditure on gold, silver, ornaments, that is all uh, valuables, were taken as consumption expenditure. Now, in the 11-12 series, post-2015, we are counting it as valuables in part of, as part of physical savings. One simple classification change, but it makes a huge difference in terms of numbers. If you see the numbers on gold, the valuables, it would actually make a difference of at least a percent in the total share. So that, that itself is a simple classification change, but makes a huge difference in terms of numbers. 
the bigger problem in 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 physical savings is how we measure and it is surprising at least for people who uh, are, are, are not very familiar with the national accounts is that of the total residual that we consider as household savings the physical savings is that is a remainder that is we only account for financial savings at the aggregate and we we conclude that the remainder is a residue the re, remainder of the residual is the physical savings now you can imagine how complex this is because investments in or i should say capital formation in the household sector in physical assets is not the most important part of savings that go into this this sector that is people investing in households and we consider that as a residual the measurement of this is so complex that it is very difficult to infer anything out of this part of uh, household sector if you can see the last part of the slide simply changing classification has led to huge amount of differences in numbers uh, i will just mention two broad issues and then uh, i'll explain wh what is the nature of our complexity in 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 savings if you can see the slide the base year change happened in 11 12 and after that although the savings rate has been declining it it's now up to 30 but this is both combining physical and financial the drop that you see in finance in in overall savings is actually because of physical savings that is the physical stock of households mainly in construction if you see the graph here that is data available till about 18 19 the red bar is what shows the physical assets it's it it went on declining from 11 12 which was the major cause for decline in overall household savings it's now hovering around 11% i mean the once the new data set for uh, once the new nas comes for 1920 and of course the situation might change a little bit post pandemic but the key point to register here is the decline is mostly on account of physical savings not much as such on based on financial savings it is still pretty much at the same level if you see seven uh, the axis is percentage so if you see it's pretty much at the, at the level at 7 to 8% although we see a, a slight decline in 18 19 but the situation might change post pandemic so you will see a rise there once because deposits have increased compared to credit so that assets have increased more than liabilities but the key problem is in the areas of physical assets three questions i will leave uh, and then uh, what is it that we can infer from this are we on a disaving path that is the first question to ask because if overall finance if overall savings are declining uh, we have to sort of understand that not all all components are declining we may be on a disaving path if we are understanding that a large part of financial savings are getting invested into the retail sector in which people are not able to uh, sort of build assets and these problems are known particularly in the real estate and construction sector that a large number of projects in the last few years have not been neither been completed and a lot of financial savings which got translated into households did not uh, materialize in that sense because uh, real estate projects were stuck second are the trends different for rural and urban india this is an important question because uh, quite frankly we don't have the distribution of savings by households in rural and urban what we understand as household savings in finances from sim simply from aggregates of different financial instruments but this clearly demarcates the difference between the rural and urban uh, urban india in the last year or so rural credit has increased more than rural deposit which actually could mean some bit of dis savings but the situation can be slightly different post pandemic so if one has to understand the difference uh, one has to look at rural and urban trends separately third is the pure question of measurement as researchers we do talk about uh, decline in savings or increase in savings or different shifts in components of savings but the truth of the matter is that our measurement issues are far more serious than what uh, appears from numbers 
data availability on capital formation, which is the physical side uh, of savings, is actually so poor that we are using uh, a very old and dated data set information uh, for computing our estimates. As it is, household savings are treated as residual. The remainder of the residual is physical savings, of which the information available is from the All India Debt Investment Survey, which was is, is now nearly 10 years old, and the 67, 65th round of NSS, which was done uh, to understand uh, housing conditions, that itself is around a decade old. Uh, if we are using outdated information uh, for computing gross fixed capital formation in the household sector, uh, I'm sure a lot of position has changed in the last decade, but we are not able to update that. So data issues and measurement problems are far more serious in this, in this, uh, in this domain, I would say, than what the numbers are actually telling. The third point that I want to stress is that physical savings, uh, as Professor Anand was also saying, relates to the, uh, has, a, has a much, much, much broader connotation. It is actually related to the problems in real estate and construction sector. Uh, it's not so simple to understand that uh, physical savings can be improved that easily. It takes a very long time, ease of doing business, uh, changes in, in real estate laws once after ERA has been implemented, completion of projects, revival of, of, of projects which have been stuck. Those are very serious issues because they have locked up a large part of savings. Housing which was constructed in the last few years, people have paid a lot of money to get those, those housing, but none of these projects have been completed. So problems in physical savings are not uh, that simple to solve. Financial savings can be solved because uh, there are many, many ways to address those problems. But physical savings are far more difficult to improve and solve these problems, and they are not limited to just in one domain. There are far more uh, serious issues to discuss. I'll stop here. Uh, if there are more questions and discussions, maybe we can take it forward because already uh, very interesting questions have already been put up by Professor Anand uh, and Sachin sir already. So I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Dr. Amir Sapre. This was very interesting. You have raised some very fundamental questions, and I'm sure uh, we will uh, take them uh, in a few minutes uh, as we complete the uh, panel discussion. Uh, I would request all those who have logged in uh, to please send your questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, the panel would be very keen to address them. Please. Uh, uh, share your ideas, suggestions, and the themes that you would like us to pick up uh, in the next uh, seminars that we would be doing. So please uh, share your ideas, impressions, suggestions, questions in the chat box. I have now great pleasure in inviting the master, Professor Manmohan Agrawal. Uh, he has been uh, one of the key commentators on, on uh, uh, macroeconomic developments in the country. He uh, served with the uh, World Bank and IMF for many years, but uh, was there at the Jawaharlal Nehru University for uh, for decades. And uh, he also served with the uh, CIGI, uh, a very important think tank, Center for International uh, Governance and Innovation in, uh, in what to do in Canada. He was RBI chair professor at Center for Development Studies, uh, CDS Trivindrum. And I'm very uh, proud to say that he is now a senior adjunct fellow at RIS and uh, has been spearheading the work program at RIS on, on finance and development. He's very closely following the G20 finance uh, initiatives. So, Professor Manmohan Agrawal, may I request you now to take over? Thank you, Sachin, very much. I have a presentation that I would like to share with you all. And it looks at what has been happening to savings and investment in the economy and I would like to tie it in to the macro situation, particularly in manufacturing. Next slide, please. Nick, yes. What I will be looking at in this presentation is the overall savings investment behavior, looking at both sector-wise, the sectors as previous panelists have mentioned, the most important is household, but I'm also looking at the corporate and public sectors. So now let me look at the overall behavior of the saving investment 
If you would go on to the next slide, please. As you can see, that savings have been going up fairly significantly, but steadily till about the financial crisis of 2007, 8. And since then, they have flattened out. Investment so shows much more unstable behavior. It rose very sharply in the first decade of this century. And then it has been on a downward path. Now, what are the reasons for this downward path in investment? We will discuss later. Next slide, please. As you can see that when you look at the savings behavior, we find that savings of all the sectors, household and public has been decreasing. Corporate is the sector which has been increasing its savings. Now that is a very interesting phenomenon. Why are the corporates saving more? Okay. And if you look at the thing, what has been happening is that the profits of companies have been kept as reserves so the reserves of countries so the, have been increasing. So the ownership part of this has been going up. Now let us look at the investment part of the story. Public sector investment has been falling. Household and corporate investment increased sharply after liberalization in 91. But since the 2008 crisis, these investments have been flat or declining. Corporate investment has been recovering in the past couple of years, but it's not clear whether what the longer term trend will be in that. Now, as the previous panelist has mentioned, household savings are divided between financial and physical savings. I want to get away from the issues of measurement, which is highlighted very much. But what you do see very clearly is that investment in financial assets has been coming down. Investment in physical assets has been going up. There are two factors behind this, a pull factor and a push factor. The pull factor has been the tax incentives that have been given to construction, residential construction in particular. These have made people invest much more in physical assets than in financial assets. And the push factor have been these scandals that have broken onto the market, starting with the Harshad Mehta scam and then the collapse of UTI. As we shall see that both of them had a very significant influence on how households allocate their savings. Now we look at the allocation of household financial savings. As you can see that the significant changes in these shares. And the most important one from my mind, from the financial market side and from the growth side is the proportion of financial savings invested in shares. You see that that was rising very sharply to the middle 1990s and then it has fallen. As I mentioned, this fall has been entirely due to scams and uncertainties in the financial market. I think SEBI has done a very poor job in regulating the share market. As you will also see that fixed deposits were rising very much till the financial crisis, but since then fixed deposits have become stable and recently declined. What has been rising is contract savings, namely in the form of insurance and provident fund. That has risen very sharply in the last decade. Next slide, please. Now, sorry about that. Now, the problem that has happened, as you can see from the behavior of savings, is that savings are very important for investment. Now, one of the panelists mentioned that savings don't create investment. Unfortunately, the situation is not quite as simple as what he has discussed. It is true that increase in savings by themselves with constant investment will lead to a decline in income and will not add to savings. 
which is pointed out by Keynes in his book 70 years, 80 years ago. But the point is this, that if you have to invest, you must have savings to invest. If you do not have domestic savings, then you have to have foreign savings and have to borrow from foreign sources to invest. Now, in the Indian context, if you look at the behavior of savings and investment, we always see that savings go up before investment goes up because we cannot afford to have a large current account deficit in a balance of payments, which borrowing abroad would mean. So it is very imperative to increase savings in our system. However, the sources for long-term investment, namely the savings that are available for long-term investment, have decreased. The de development finance companies have been converted into commercial banks, whether we take ICICI or whether we take IDBI. As we have seen, individual investors have been scared away from the stock market. The banks are stressed by rise in NPAs arising from infrastructure financing. Banks were not meant to use short-term deposits for long-term infrastructure investment, but they've been put into this role and NPAs have been rising. In the last seven years, you will notice that bank credit to manufacturing has increased from 46% to 32% and to personal loans have increased from 18 to 28%, mainly in the form of in loans for housing. So what you have is a strictly very distorted allocation of financial savings to financial, to physical investment, to housing in particular. For instance, if you look at what is historically the situation, 60% of gross fixed capital formation was used for investment in machinery and equipment and the rest for construction. In the last decade, these proportions have been reversed. Much of the gross fixed capital formation now goes into construction and not into machinery and equipment. And because companies want to prevent an increase in the debt equity ratios, they have been constrained by the accumulated reserves to financial investments. So most companies which are listed on the stock market, whether they are mid cap, large cap or small cap, have not seen any increase in their real capital stock during the last decade. This is mainly because of a decrease in the rate of profit that companies earn. Now, what needs to be done to increase savings of households? I think the main thing that needs to be done is to increase the instruments in which households can save. What has happened is that the instruments in which households can save have been squeezed. They really basically have a choice between deposits and insurance really. And they are frozen out from the stock market, the share market and stuff like that. And unless we can give them more options, it is going to be very difficult for households to raise their savings rate, feel comfort comfortable enough to do that. Now, the most recent aspect which has been mentioned is that government has been toying with the idea of making deposits in commercial banks convertible forcibly into shares if the banks run into problems. I think this needs to be thoroughly thought out because it can have very many unintended consequences. As we have noticed, people are investing, putting more of their money into deposits. But if this is the way deposits are treated, they may be scared away from deposits and we will find that most of their investment will go back into gold and perhaps again into housing particularly if housing continues to be encouraged by tax treatment. Or those with larger amounts of deposits may shift their deposits from Indian public sector banks and private sector banks into foreign banks. I don't know whether that is a consequence we would like to benefit from. Now, let me just touch on two points. As I've mentioned, one of the other things was that why do we need savings? Savings are created by government spending and all that. We need savings because in the Indian context, savings precede investment. What about foreign savings? Can we depend on foreign savings? Now, foreign savings, no country in the world has ever depended on foreign savings for large share of their investment. Even China, which is so-called a haven for FDI, FDI was basic, barely about 5% of their total investments. 
So I think we need higher rates of savings, particularly with the household sector. We need higher rates of savings with the government. The government has been the biggest disaver. And that has meant that the public sector has been strangled because of lack of government savings. Whether it's the physical public sector, their companies, public enterprises, or whether it has been the public sector in the form of education and health. I think we severely need to curtail public consumption and raise public savings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Manmohan Agrawal, for bringing in some very uh, real and, uh, and practical issues before us and also contextualizing the conceptual framework that is required to be addressed. Uh, I would now uh, turn it back to uh, uh, the chairman of the session, um, uh, 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 Shri Rajneesh Kumarji, for uh, taking us forward through question and answer sessions. I'm sure uh, our participants are, are showing a lot of enthusiasm and uh, concerns which are emanating out of this uh, panel discussion, which was extremely exciting. So back to you, uh, Mr. Kumar. So thank you very much. And I think a uh, lot of insights. And uh, although everybody said that uh, 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 they were hesitant to admit that uh, they don't have an idea, but uh, what I find that all of them have brought a very different perspective. And it has been a wonderful, uh, uh, I would say, a wonderful presentation by all the three panelists. And uh, we have a lot of questions coming in. And uh, luckily, we have some time because of the very good time management by the participants themselves. So they are not overstressed. And uh, the question I will take one by one. And uh, any of the panelists, uh, if it is a specific, I will direct to the uh, specifically or otherwise a general question. You can pick up. So the one question is. With pandemonium in banking, Anand, how to increase credit GDP ratio as in US China? Um, thank you, Chairman, sir, and uh, my compliments to Professor Sapre and uh, uh, Professor Agarwal. I think there was uh, fantastic uh, presentations as well. Um, uh, the good point about a good presentation is we have points of agreement and points of disagreement. Uh, we should know the, the good point of a discussion is uh, agree without being disagree or disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, the, uh, Chairman, sir, uh, Rajesh Kumar, sir, uh, to your question that you raised uh, via the participant, um, I think it's absolutely essential that we raise our credit deposit ratio um, to, to effectively, I do think, bank credit and therefore uh, fostering our investment is going to be a big, big part of our push to create jobs and output and therefore solve for all the uh, macro issues that we have for the country and to uh, realize our dreams. How do we do it in the midst of a pandemic? Sir, many years ago, if you recollect, I think it was a 2016 pre-budget economic survey. Um, uh, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam had spoken of the four R's. In fact, you were part of a lot of these uh, committees as well in the, in the Sashakt and uh, those kind of uh, committees uh, where we talked about recognition, resolution, um, recapitalization and reform. I think, sir, while a lot of good work has happened since then, um, much still needs to be done. And these four pillars still remain the edifice by which we can get to do uh, to improve our banking system. Uh, recognition, a lot of improvement has happened. AQR has happened. But uh, through the course of the pandemic, we've got more forbearances. We've got uh, uh, incomplete disclosures. NBFCs have not gone through a full-fledged AQR as yet. Uh, there is still doubt about what is the true nature of NPAs in the system. Second, on resolution, I think IBC is a fantastic piece of resolution, uh, you know, uh, legislation, but it's gone into teething issues, with the, with the legal issues. Of course, now it's closed because of the pandemic. More importantly, sir, you know, if you're looking at something like, you know, the RBI says 13.5 to 14.8 percent non-performing assets. Plus, there is a lot which has been written off already. If we add all of that, it's over 20 percent of non-performing assets. No resolution mechanism in the world, sir, is geared towards this kind of sizes. So I do think we need a one-off resolution of the NPAs, get them off the bank's books. I know it's a bad word to say bad bank, but some solution to get the bankers to worry about fresh lending rather than old lending. But alongside that, there has to be reform and recapitalization. Recapitalization, we know what that is. Uh, it is happening on, alongside reform, sir. I'm a fan of the PJNI committee recommendations of 2014. Uh, I do think it's important that the public sector bankers be given more autonomy, professional autonomy to run their businesses. 
I do think that they should be under Companies Act rather than under Bank Nationalization Act or the uh, SBI Act. Um, I do think they should be on a level playing field with the private sector bankers. Uh, this is not a resolution for their governance issues. Governance issues are there across private sector banks, public sector banks, and everybody else. Um, governance reforms are separately ongoing, whether it is rating agencies, auditors, boards, risk managements, even the supervisory uh, mechanism itself. Uh, that is ongoing. We are hopefully learning from our mistakes. But this cleansing of the financial sector is required. And we need bankers then to start looking with the ability and willingness to lend all over again. Um, this is only one part, sir. The second part for credit GDP ratio to go up is our economy should be good for investments. It should be friendly for investments and in creating jobs and output. Today, does, a, does any large corporate really want to start a manufacturing plant with 10,000 employees um, and create widgets in India? I think it's improving with PLI, et cetera, but a long, long way to go before we can anywhere aspire to become close to what Vietnam, Bangladesh, or China have managed. We have a long, long way to go. Combination of these two, financial sector reforms as well as uh, real sector reforms can instigate a process where credit GDP growth can go up in a healthy, sustainable manner, which creates jobs and output. OK. Right. Uh, no, I fully agree with uh, Professor Anand Narayan that uh, the financial intermediation where the banking system creates, uh, banking system plays a very critical role in channelizing the savings and then deploying them. And uh, that is where that shift, which is happening, where banks are more comfortable lending for to the individuals for housing for cars, loan against salary. And unfortunately, the lending to the corporates has come down. And there are reasons and uh, uh, there can be a debate that why that is happening. But uh, it is uh, definitely uh, being a banker. I know that uh, the mindset has become that uh, you lend to the individuals or the, uh, the sick because that is safer. and. Uh, uh, the accountability aspects also, uh, they play a very critical role and uh, I can share with you that there was a time when it used to be a matter of honor and pride to be in the corporate lending. But today, in a statement, I had to perforce introduce incentive for people to be coming to the corporate lending. So, <laughs> Uh, a, a very strong financial system or the banking system, it is a must and we all know that uh, there is a lot of debate around the DFI, uh, there is a lot of debate about the bad bank, so it's a good debate. Uh, Professor Agrawal, you want to mention something? Two points. One is that, you know, we have been trying to change the financial sector, bring the banks to health, but very slowly. And this is not a thing that can be done slowly. I think if you look at all the debt resolutions in the past, whether it's of private entities or of the governments, like in the Latin American debt crisis, things have been to be cleaned out thoroughly before you can move forward. So doing it piecemeal ends up by spending more resources, but not getting the positive kick in coming back to investment. And the second thing that I'd like to throw out is an idea is that it has become very easy and cheap for the government to use tax money to keep recapitalizing the banks, but not getting them away from the old habits. I think somewhere nobody has paid any penalty for the bad loans. I think we need to find some system where people have to be held responsible for them and don't find an easy way of using taxpayer money to bail out the banks. Yeah, that is a like a debate we can have maybe Professor Chaturvedi will organize one session. That would be the seventh session. <laughs> it will need another two hours to debate this uh, issue. And uh, another question is like uh, uh, that is for uh, obviously for uh, 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 Amay Sapre to answer. How can we handle data issues and measurement problems? Any suggestions? Okay. Uh Thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, for posting this question. Uh, this is actually a very broad question to ask, but uh, yes, data issues are a bigger problem, and they actually... So I, I say this because uh, 
it just poses two simple problems one is that the current situation might be more <clears throat> misleading than what it is and second as we improve data collection our our ability to infer sort of improves how to do that particularly in the construction that is for real estate and 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 construction of the household we need more frequent surveys that take up uh, the state of households all india india uh, debt survey that is the only way out to reach the household to collect information on quality of construction investments and and that and and the material that goes in because if if you understand i mean i'm just trying to be very brief uh, the, the system requires what is known as a commodity flow unless you track all inputs that go into construction unless you track all investments that goes into in the real estate sector from the households we will not be able to prepare estimates of uh, the household sector for physical assets partly this information is collected from surveys our most of our surveys are quinquennial which is done once in 5 years unless we improve the frequency of surveys that is not possible to do so the first and foremost way to do that is to improve uh, the frequency of surveys and that is the only way we will be able to generate uh, quality estimates of households uh, in the physical in the physical uh, assets Uh, if that answers the question or if there is more detail uh, the measurement issue is slightly different i have not even touched on that i have just uh, i have just, just touched upon the availability of data the measurement issue is far more complex because that involves what a commodity flow method is and what are we even capturing so that quality is 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 pretty serious and it requires but, a separate, uh, separate today because of technology uh, is there a way where uh, like uh, we can collect the data in a different uh, manner yes the nss uh, the nsso that is the wing of the cso the central statistics organization they do that and we have been able to improve the data collection but not for all surveys mostly this has been tried out in consumption expenditure surveys which are itself dated now the current expenditure survey is about 10 years old so mm. yes technology does play an important part but uh, quite frankly the 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 landscape of households on which we are we are supposed to collect information that is a very difficult task because most of these households uh, i mean the frequency and the and, and the depth at which we want to collect this is is far more complex <coughs> so yes technology does play but it has not been tried out for all kinds of uh, surveys as of now Great. So uh, now there are uh, there is one more question which uh, uh, either of the panelists can take up is uh, how does manpower and training figure into the equation of savings? So whether it does, and if uh, the answer is yes, then what concerted efforts are being undertaken? Okay. Anyone uh, on this subject? Is skilling? I think essentially the question is about the skilling. Who would like okay, to? If that is, yeah, Professor. Okay, if that is, if that is in terms of skilling and other things, I think Professor Anand can go first. I will have only a small point to contribute on this. Uh, Professor Anand can go first. Oh, please go ahead, Sanjay. Please, uh, oh. Amir, please go ahead, and I'll follow you. Okay. Uh, my version on this problem is that uh, we have to understand that we don't have an income distribution in this country. We don't collect incomes. we are trying to infer about savings but as of now we don't we don't have a capture of income by any means unless we assume that the information that we capture on employment from the employment survey is the wages of the casual workers so currently we have the periodic labor force survey which gives you an estimate of wages of casual laborers on a daily basis that is the maximum extent of capture of income that we have so if the question is is in terms of training and and skilling yes that is is possible with the assumption that they are income enhancing programs absolutely but quite so frankly income uh, goes up i think yes. it can result into more savings so there is provided, a correlation yes provided we have a mechanism to capture that income but we don't right. have that 
so i think professor okay. anand would be able or professor agarwal would be able to add to this this more i am actually more of, uh, from a realistic perspective that this is really not we are not able to capture this kind of uh, income if i can add chairman sir um, i think what professor sapre is saying is right in terms of the measurement problems that we have but more from a practical aspect um, uh, the way i see the the solution working sir is we have investments which create output and jobs that in turn creates um, uh, money for or, or in, creates consumption and uh, savings which in turn creates a nice virtuous cycle so now one of the problems we face and sir you would know this very well um, we have a problem of underemployment in this country where we have large swathes of people who are underemployed particularly in the agricultural sector and at the same time you will find people especially setting up factories in the urban areas or in the uh, suburbs telling you that they are not able to find enough skilled workers right so we have this blow hot and blow cold of enough workers available but not of the right uh, quality or the right skills um now we don't have to fret too much about this because every country goes through this i have worked in vietnam i have worked in bangladesh i have seen how they have had to solve these problems as they grew up in in over the last 10 15 years uh, so we will also solve this problem but the the question to the to answer the question skilling plays an extremely important role i think in the overall uh, income of the country um and, and the overall gdp of the country and and the more skilled you are the more you are able to invest produce um as an output and the more the output obviously the more is available for splitting between consumption and savings uh, and therefore the overall number goes up so i think it's inherently linked to that um to the extent we can improve our skilling and take on and by the way china is following this policy of china 2025 now where they want to move away from low skilled manufacturing assembly kind of jobs into high tech artificial intelligence 5, 5g and, and those kind of areas so they are already thinking of Uh, going to the next scale of skilling so that they can move from a middle income country to a high income country um we are still in the stage where we are moving from low income to middle income and and therefore there's a long runway ahead of us before we can get there but i think there's an absolutely very very deep intrinsic relationship between the quality of the labor force and therefore the output and therefore the amount of savings right professor agarwal you wanted to add something yes i think you know the problem is that we have to decide who has the responsibility from providing the skilling i think people tend to look at the education sector and say that the education sector is not doing a good job they don't provide the right training but you know university or a school is not there to provide specific training for a specific job it is to provide broad based learning in the old days it used to be the companies themselves who would provide the specific skills required for their own job now that the companies have stopped doing for some reason and we are left in a limbo as to who is going to provide the skills and i don't think we have solved that problem our apprenticeship system is not working our industrial training institutes are not really providing the right kind of training but i also would like to point out a one broad sort of conceptual feature about data and statistics that has been raised and that is that you know economic causality is a very complex picture you require a lot of data before you can decide between two alternative explanations for behavior and that um, requires a lot of data and a lot of expense in collecting that data since we don't have the kind of data that will allow us to distinguish between different hypotheses policy makers don't find the data very useful and so they neglect collecting data so every developing country you find has this problem that because the existing data does not provide solutions to answers to questions that are raised in policy they end up by not having data and i think we need to recognize this that we require a lot of data before we can use the data successfully for policy making right and then there are three more questions as well as suggestions which uh, of course maybe as a banker i will have to answer and this is all about the question is that uh, uh, one of the participants has written that mr rajesh kumar there are very limited investment options left for seniors which would pay more than inflation psu and all bank should consider increasing fd rate so we can save <coughs> adequately for our future the second is related globally policy makers have incentivized borrowers to borrow more at the expense of savers in an era of low interest rate 
what are the lessons for India, given our demographics and inflationary growth nature? And another is same, what is your suggestion to the public? The best saving method for the retirement is the falling interest rate sector. So these all three are, I would say, related questions. And uh, uh, really, there is a problem. And now I am also in that category of retired senior citizen. There is definitely really a problem. And uh, there was a time that the interest rate used to be as high as 12%. So our favorite was past sal me double ho jaye, you know. There was time that five years you have to double. But we also should remember that it was the period when the inflation was very high. So we have to always consider the real interest rates. So recently, of course, and that may be a temporary phenomena that the real interest rates have become negative. Uh, right now, the interest rate being offered by the banks and the inflation, it is. Uh, but for quite some time, the real interest rates were positive. When the inflation was low, but the banks were paying high interest rate. And then there was a lot of demand that if we have to bring back growth in the economy, interest rates have to be low. And then came the pandemic. And in that scenario, uh, the regulator or as uh, an institution, Reserve Bank of India, uh, there is always like they have to do this balancing between the growth and inflation. Uh, I mean, I think most of the time in Reserve Bank, I'm sure, would be spent only on this that how do they balance this requirement? And in a pandemic situation, I think uh, anybody would advocate that the interest rates have to be lower. And that is would lead to growth. So I think this debate, there is not an easy answer. And uh, even the suggestion about the best saving method, there is, uh, it cannot be a general answer to this because each individual's risk appetite and the financial savings which one individual has, they differ. So obviously, because the banks, the fixed deposits, why they are so popular? Because one, uh, all the senior citizens or every citizen in the country, it is considered to be the safest. But because it is the safest, that's why it is not the best when it comes to giving the return. So there is something called risk return matrix. So the best is that depending upon the kitty or the savings you have, uh, you have to allocate. And as I said that each individual's risk appetite is different. And uh, there has to be definitely a good portion in the bank uh, where because not for anything else, but for the safety reasons, as well as the liquidity. Similarly, mutual funds, they have some risk associated with it, but very liquid. Same you can say with the stocks. Liquidity is not an issue. Uh, returns, again, uh, for an individual picking the stocks, uh, that again is a very sort of, I would say, risky appeal. So I think bank deposits and then in the next category would be the uh, mutual funds. And uh, the other innovative instruments like now the gold is coming in the now demetalized form. So even the uh, gold bonds uh, where like we will want to invest. So that has become a good, in, uh, good instrument uh, for, uh, uh, for, it, uh, for guarding your money against inflation. It doesn't take into your inflation because gold price tend to move up if inflation is higher so there is a i would only my my answer would be that you have to uh, have a mix of financial products and i am presuming that uh, the uh, the financial savings uh, everybody uh, depends apart from if there are retirement benefits so depending upon your own situation and your risk appetite uh, as each financial instrument has its pros and so I cannot give a very straight answer to uh, this question.
Professor Anand, do you want to add something? Yes, sir. Uh, th thanks, Jaman, sir. And, um, and you, you articulated extremely well, sir. I think you gave a very balanced view um, uh, from across all perspectives. I'll just add a couple of points, sir. Um, I, I would be OK if interest rates, bank interest rates, et cetera, are determined by the market, simple by supply and demand. But in our country, a big part of the determination of the interest rates is also because is also through financial repression, which is RBI fixes interest rates at a particular point. It then undertakes open market operations, brings down 10 year bond yields. It floods the market with liquidity, forces banks to buy government bonds, brings down interest rates um, and therefore modulates interest rates to below where it would have been had it been a free market with the government borrowing 14 lakh crores to fund its fiscal deficit. Right. Now, when we are doing financial repression and giving negative, by the way, my mother stays with me uh, and she thinks inflation is 10% plus in her perception. So for her, when she gets 5.5% interest rate or 6% with senior citizens, for her, it is a terrible rate right? and she doesn't know how she will survive. The, the point being that we, uh, I think Professor Agarwal also mentioned this, we have too many votaries and lobbyists for the borrowers, uh, for the industry. <laughs> saying that you know or and for the government saying interest rates have to be brought down and not enough for the savers in in uh, deference to free markets or or at least where the market should be uh, there are downsides to this you know uh, one of the issues that we have is if inflation if i'm getting a negative return from in, from deposits i'm forced to look at um, riskier options even if my risk appetite is on the lower side uh, if i'm getting 6% on fixed deposits and post tax i'm getting below 4% 4% is a rubbish return. I will have to go into equity markets even if I think it's, it is overvalued. So I think um, one way out in this particular situation could be for the government to actually announce a window where it borrows at a meaningful rate directly from savers. You know, and Professor, I think Dr. Subarao has also spoken about this. I'm also a votary of something like a Corona bond. Uh, give, let's say, 6% tax post-tax returns to uh, lenders or to uh, savers including my mother, she'll happily put in that in that kind of a bond. Uh, use it for productive investments into infrastructure, education, et cetera, that I mentioned. Um, and, and use it to give a good return to savers and to stop money going into risky assets and creating asset bubbles. In fact, the governor has spoken about asset bubbles. These are being created by artificially low interest rates. And there is a downside, therefore, of, of keeping rates repressed too low. But uh, it's, it's as you said, sir, it's a complicated topic. No easy answers. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, very meaningful and very useful discussion. And I'm very sure that all the participants, they would have enjoyed this discussion. So I would now uh, like to hand over to Professor Sachin Chaturvedi for the closing. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Mr. Kumar, for uh, very, very well capturing the key points that have emerged and also responding to uh, several questions that our participants have uh, raised today. As everybody would agree, uh, we had very, very productive uh, uh, discussion, very useful points have emerged. And I think uh, uh, the purpose of having this uh, uh, series uh, is very well served. Uh, I would uh, uh, request Mr. Vora to, uh, uh, to say a few words as we close. Uh, uh, but let me uh, bring in here a couple of points that I think uh, have emerged very well as uh, uh, chairman of the session, Mr. Kumar, have uh, pointed out. Uh, the, the first and foremost is uh, the uh, consensus that uh, the panel has come up with in terms of uh, decline that we are say, uh, seeing in the uh, uh, savings rate. That, I think, is, is something that everybody has agreed. Everybody has agreed with the point that you require new instruments to come up to encourage, incentivize long-term saving. And as Professor Agrawal and uh, Professor Anant both have emphasized, uh, uh, we require uh, uh, the interests of uh, small depositors, uh, uh, the pension funds to be uh, more activated. Obviously, we have to go beyond PPF. And as uh, Mr. Kumar said, that uh, uh, double your amount in five years, that kind of thing, uh, the, the era is over. We would have to see what new mechanisms are. I think uh, uh, Amir Sapre has brought out this very important point of uh, 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 data limitations that we need to, to work out, and that is important. But I think the punchline came from uh, uh, Mr. Kumar when he said that uh, we require uh, deposits to be safe, but with better returns. And this trade-off that we are seeing, I think, is the, 
biggest challenge and and uh, uh, i'm glad that manmohan agrawal reminded of us of uh, harshad mehta and the era that we saw but i think since then the governance has improved and has improved to a great extent but there are areas uh, where we need more uh, uh, to be done so that uh, uh, the the new generation that is now moving towards uh, uh, the uh, 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 huge list of pensioners that is growing in india we need to see that they are more incentivized to to park and we do not uh, depend too much on the foreign savings uh, i think uh, uh, these were very important uh, uh, issues that have come up i had also proposed to uh, uh, vora sahab that uh, some of these presentations then can be turned into a, a, a volume uh, after the uh, uh, six seminars that we have and these are very policy relevant uh, suggestions something that uh, uh, india international center and ris have been working for uh, we also have iic quarterly that also gets lot of uh, attention i think some of these can also form and be contributed there but i would now like to request uh, 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 president of india international center would us up to uh, have few words and then we close uh, uh, would us up you have the floor <clears throat> thank you sachin uh, i would at this stage uh, uh, not tire out anybody we don't say very much a first of all let me say that straight away i agree with you that we should keep some record of these discussions and translate into a uh, simply stated text uh, which can be published in the quarterly or as occasional papers or as you said earlier maybe it can after a couple of webinars uh, we can bring out a slim volume on a particular set of issues that that i think would be perhaps the most useful from your reference point of view but if some worthwhile and practical recommendations emerge out of one or two sets of discussions i would recommend to you strongly that you could think of forwarding the same to the concerned quarters in the government or the reserve bank for instance today's discussion two simple things have emerged i will not go into issues of uh, macroeconomics or uh, data gathering and analysis one is safe deposits safe uh, savings and be reasonable savings returns rates of interest these two things i am in the same category as professor narayan's mother and i feel that the eroion which takes place in fixed deposits and all you get is a senior citizen is 5.5% 5.5% minus tax gives you what a little over 3% so this is really a waste of time so if the government has to seriously think of what kind of instruments to to make available what kind of products which will attract uh, savings and uh, add to the corpus of capital available for beneficial investments for better growth larger growth and faster growth so thank you very much sachin for um, uh, enabling this as a webinar to take place today and inviting a very eminent people to participate and i thank all of them for sparing time thank you very much thank you thanks thanks for us sir i thank all the panelists i thank the chair uh, for steering us through and giving us very stimulating points thanks for us sir for this partnership between ris and india international center i also thank all our participants large number of them who could join today and have responded have sent their questions and i'm keenly looking forward for the series to go forward thanks once again and we would come back to you uh, with the uh, many more interesting themes in the days to come thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.